In case you didn't notice it this morning, our sister Linda Chaffins was back in the audience. Been a while. She has had two very serious surgeries and one more to go. And in case you didn't notice it, the, the, the speaker system is coming and going. So if it goes, I'll get louder. But now listen, if I get louder and it comes back on without me knowing it, you're going to jump, maybe. <clears throat> but but we'll, we'll work with it. We'll work with it. Listen, have you ever been at somebody's home or, or seen something that somebody had? And you saw that thing and you said to yourself, man, I wish I had one of them. Many of you have things that I don't have. No doubt I've got some things that you don't have. But we all have some things in common. We all have air to breathe. We have food to eat. We got clothing on our backs. And something else that we all have in common, we all have time. Benjamin Franklin said that time is the stuff that life is made of. William Shakespeare said, he that steals my purse steals trash, and then somebody later on added on to that saying. And here's what they added on. He who steals my purse steals trash, but he who steals my time steals my life. Each year we live, we've been given around 8,760 hours to live. That would be 525,600 minutes. That would be 31,536,000 seconds that we have. And what we do with the time that God has given us will certainly determine where we stand when we are before our Creator on that great judgment day. This morning I want us all to consider the word time. A word that's found some 619 times in the King James Version of the Bible. Time. Something that right now we all have. But no promise is given as to how much of it anybody here will continue to have. One of the beautiful passages of Scripture that's found in the Word of God was a passage that was written by the wise man Solomon in the long ago. It's in the book of Ecclesiastes, and it's there in chapter 3 and verse 1 that what Solomon writes, to everything there is a season and a time to every purpose under heaven. And then in verse 2, that wisest of men tells us of that which we all have had time to do and will have time to do because there he says that there is a time to be born and a time to die. Although death is a subject that we often try to avoid and sometimes we'll do so at any cost, yet this enemy of mankind is a reality that we might as well face the fact that someday we're going to face it. In the very beginning of the Garden of Eden, it was not that way because it's not always been that way. Because in that Garden of Eden, God had placed the tree of life. A wondrous tree because if one ate of this tree of life, then they had perpetual life. They, they weren't going to get older. They weren't going to face that enemy called death. They were not going to find that day when they eventually would give up this life. As long as they ate of the tree of life, they lived. But then because of the sin committed by Adam and Eve and their disobedience to the command of God, Adam and Eve were cast out of that Garden of Eden and were separated from the tree of life and thus growing old and dying became a part of the existence for not only them, but for everyone who lived thereafter. In fact, death is a promise we all, we're all going to have to meet. 
Hebrews 9.27 tells us so plainly, And as it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this, the judgment. And so it behooves us all to realize that for the hours, days, and years that we're permitted to dwell upon this footstool of Almighty God, we are here in preparation for that time when we put off the earthly tabernacle and eventually face the very God of the universe to be judged according to our works. Nearing the end of the great Apostle Paul, nearing the end of his life, thinking that he was probably going to be martyred by the Roman government for his Christianity, and indeed he was. He was beheaded simply because he was a Christian and had been preaching about that resurrected Christ. That same Apostle Paul said in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 6 through 8, he said, I'm now ready to be offered. And the time of my departure is at hand. I've fought a good fight. I've finished my course. I've kept the faith. Henceforth there's laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day, and not to me only, but unto all them also that love His appearing. So Paul realized, just as men die, he too was going to have to give up his life. But you know what? He didn't fear. He didn't fear because he had kept the faith. I want you to notice that according to the Word of God, in the passages we've already seen, there is but one faith. We live in a world containing well over 300 different faiths, but the Bible never speaks of more than one faith. In fact, we read in Acts chapter 6 and verse 7, the Word of God increased. The number of disciples multiplied in Jerusalem, and a number of the priests were obedient to, listen, to the faith. A number of the priests were obedient to the faith. 2 Corinthians 13.5 says, Examine yourselves, whether you be in the faith. Colossians 2 and verse 7, the Christians at Colossae are encouraged to be established in the faith. 1 Timothy 4 and verse 1, Paul says, some shall depart from the faith. The Word of God says there's one faith. A faith built upon the very Word of God with nothing added to or nothing taken away. Anytime we talk about life, I guess, we've got to talk about the brevity of life. We've got to talk about how short life is. The psalmist said in Psalms 89, and verse, 47, or verse 47, he says, Remember how short my time is. James 4.14 says, For what is your life? It is even a vapor that appeareth for a little while, and then vanisheth away. Let's face it, when compared with eternity, what time we dwell upon this earth is just so minute. In the book of Job, we find this righteous man suffering as a result of no wrong or sin that he's done. He's lost his children to death. He's lost his servants also to death. He's lost his wealth. He's covered from head to foot with boils. And even his wife has attempted to get him to turn from the very God who gave him life. And Job bewails his condition. In Job chapter 10, and it's in that chapter that Job says in verses 20 and 21, Are not my days few? Cease then, and let me alone that I may comfort a little. Before I go, whence I shall not return, even to the land of darkness and the shadow of death. Listen, thanks be to God that when it comes time for us to go through that shadow of death that Job spoke of, we can do so without fear. Because the psalmist said in Psalms 23 and verse 4, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, thou fear no evil. For thou art with me, thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. 
death is described as a shadow. It's described as a shadow because nobody alive knows exactly what it's like to go through death. Your body shows a shadow upon the wall when the sun's shining across it. We see that shadow, we can tell that it's a human, but we can't tell much more about it. We might be able to tell if it's a man or a woman by the clothing it has on, or by the length of, well, no, not by the length of hair. Anyway, we may be able to tell that, but we can't tell much more. Well, death is that way. We know that death exists. We have seen the results of death, but we don't know exactly what it's like yet. We will someday, but not yet. And so the psalmist and Job both speak of the shadow of death. Death is a shadow because no one who's alive knows exactly what it's like to pass from life to death, but we can rest assured that children of Almighty God do not have to make that journey from here to eternity alone. The psalmist says that when that time comes, he knows that the Lord is with him. We're able to get encouragement from the book of Luke chapter 16 because there we read of the beggar Lazarus who when he died was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. To be in somebody's bosom in, that, in those days was to be the one who was seated immediately beside them, closest to them, a place of honor. So let us all consider that the time will come when we must take our last breath, we must shed this earthly body, but our soul will live on. And the children of God who have been faithful can rest assured that when that soul makes the journey from the tabernacle called the body to the dwelling to come, that that soul can make the journey with the comfort of being in the presence of our eternal Creator. Time. How you use your time? One of the best ways we can use our time on earth is involved in worshiping God. The psalmist wrote in the long ago in Psalms 115 and verse 18, he said, but we will bless the Lord from this time forth and forevermore praise the Lord. The word bless here is the Hebrew word barak. It means to kneel. To kneel. What a privilege it is to be able to come together as those created and worship the one who has created us. The psalmist wrote in the long ago in Psalms 29 and verse 2, Give unto the Lord the glory due unto His name. Worship the Lord. The Apostle John wrote in John 4.24 that God is a spirit, and they that worship Him must worship Him in spirit and in truth. But you know, there's some that don't. There's some that don't worship God in spirit and in truth. How do we know that? Well, because Jesus said in Mark 15, 9, and Mark 7, or Matthew 15, 9, and Mark 7, 7, Jesus said, But in vain do they worship me, teaching for doctrine the commandments of men. So do you see the importance of worshiping only in the ways that are authorized by the Holy Word of God? The word worship, by the way, is the Greek word sebo. It means worthiness or acknowledgement of worthiness. When we worship, we're placing God in a position so much higher than anything that we can ever reach or accomplish. Do you consider that? Who's worship for? Well, I like going there because it makes me feel good. It's not what worship's about. Worship is to give praise to God, not about my own personal feelings. But if we worship God, we should feel that we're doing as we should. Let me suggest that when we worship the Creator in spirit and in truth, we're not only using our time wisely, but we are redeeming the time. Ephesians 5.16 tells us to redeem the time. 
the re word redeem means in the original language to make a wise and sacred use of every opportunity to do good. So when we worship God, we're redeeming the time. When we do good to and for others, we are redeeming the time. When we walk in the footsteps of Jesus, we are redeeming the time. Notice that God does not live in this thing called time as we do. I've heard eternity described as the absence of time. For there's no time in eternity. We are controlled by the clock. We get up at a certain time. We must be at school at a certain time. We must be at work at a certain time. We try to get to bed at a certain time so we can get the rest that we need. But what is time to God? To show how man thinks of time and how God thinks of time, we're going to turn to the book of 2 Peter chapter 3. In 2 Peter chapter 3, the Apostle Peter is writing concerning folks who doubt that the Lord will ever return to accept His own. Now, Jesus had promised... John chapter 14, a verse that some of you can probably quote all the way through. Jesus says, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. Behold, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, so that where I am, there you may be also. Jesus said, I'm coming back. Amen. He promised. In 2 Peter chapter 3, we read about folks who knew that the Lord had promised to come back, and yet He hadn't come back yet, and it had been over 30 years since Jesus had made that statement that Peter writes what he does in 2 Peter chapter 3. Therefore, some folks believed and must have taught that the Lord, well, it's been over 30 years. He's not coming back. Let's suppose that somebody here at church comes up to you and says, I'm going to come over and see you at your house. And they don't show up that week, and they don't show up the next week. They don't show... And after 30 years, they've still not shown up. What conclusion have you drawn? They ain't come. That's how man thinks. That's how man thinks. But time means nothing to God. In fact, Peter writes in 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 8, he says, But beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day is with the Lord as a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day. Time, time doesn't mean anything to God as it does to us. But Peter does go on. And Peter does declare that the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night because he says, the Lord is not slack concerning His promise as some men count slackness. Well, let's bring our lesson down now to a very personal level. We're going to turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 6. In 2 Corinthians chapter 6, the Apostle Paul is going to deal with the ministry that he has been involved with, and he's going to give a summary to the Christians at Corinth about his ministry. He got, he's going to start off by talking about a message of salvation. I want you to notice his words in 2 Corinthians 6, 1 and 2. He says, We then, as workers together with Him, beseech you also that you receive not the grace of God in vain. For He saith, and now Paul's going to quote from Isaiah 49 and verse 8, He saith, I have heard thee in a time accepted, and in the day of salvation have I succored thee. Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. 
I looked up that word suckered. I had to look up how to, how to uh, pronounce it correctly too. The word suckered found in this verse is the Greek word boetheo. It means to help or to aid. Indeed, God is our helper. Indeed, God is our aid. Because only He can offer us salvation. But the warning is given that we need to accept that salvation now. For now is the accepted time. You wonder why now is the accepted time? Because there's no guarantee that we're going to live another year or another month or another day, as far as that goes, another minute. And since we have no guarantee of any more life to come, and we know, as our brother Alvin pointed out earlier today, that there is a place called hell, a place to be shunned away from, and we know that the only way that we can shun away from that place called hell is to be obedient to the gospel and faithful to the Lord, then that makes now the accepted time because we don't know if we're going to even make it through today. More than once I have visited with folks who I think sincerely intended to obey the gospel of Christ at some time in the future. And in fact, that would be their answer when you'd try to talk to them about their soul. Their answer would be, someday, someday, but for some of them, someday never came because death visited them because that day ever arrived, before that day ever arrived. And they had to enter eternity unprepared. What a horrible day that would be for their family. What a horrible day that would be for those who cared and loved those folks. And what a horrible day it would be for them having to meet God unprepared. Listen, right now you have time. Right now. Redeem that time. Use it wisely. Use this time you have to obey the gospel that Jesus died for. Make this the day that you're baptized for the remission of your sins. Make this the day that you leave this building a child of God. The invitation yours. If you're subject to it, we invite you to come forward, please. While together we stand and sing. When we